Welcome back to a special edition of the Business of Government Hour, a conversation with authors exploring ideas for improving government effectiveness with Dr. Zeke Emanuel, author of Reinventing American Healthcare. Zeke, you point out that the healthcare system in the U.S. is dynamic, and in that, you outline six megatrends in healthcare uh, that are very provocative in some cases. I want to touch on as many as I can with the limited amount of time we have. First up, the first trend you note is the end of insurance companies as we know them. Would you explain why you believe this is the case, and what uh, changes will precipitate the evolution of the insurance company? What's the insurance company going to look like? Well, so I think we're having a, we're undergoing a big transformation, and, and one of the ways I describe it, uh, I'll give you the headline, and then I'll, I'll try to explain how it gets there, is the Kaiserification of American healthcare. We are in an evolutionary process from fragmented delivery system. We're now creating these accountable care organizations that are accountable for the health care from primary care to specialist care to hospital care to home rehab to just integrating the full scope of care. We're incentivizing the creation of them. The private industry is also uh, working with them so that we have more continuity and in integrated care. And once you've got those organizations, they're what I call metastable. They're, they're a stage in the evolution because the only thing they're missing from becoming a Kaiser or an integrated delivery system is the actuarial predictions and financial risk management. And that, I think, they can get. It's not brain surgery. It's not rocket science. It's something that you can develop or get. And it turns out that a lot of large accountable care organizations are getting it. Mount Sinai is going to begin offering a Medicare Advantage plan where they take insurance and provide all the care. Mass General and the Brigham, the Partners Group in Boston are doing the same thing. Long Island Jewish in New York already offered a product on the exchanges. So you're seeing these large provider groups getting into provide, uh, offering insurance as well and becoming integrated delivery systems. Now the flip side is what's an insurance company going to do? How are they going to respond to this change? Well, one thing they could do is ignore it, and then they'll become extinct, I believe. Another thing is they can peddle their expertise in you know, claims management, predictive modeling, and risk uh, adjustment, and help providers. But the third thing, which they're already beginning to do, is they're beginning to either buy up providers or create joint ventures with providers to, again, create their own integrated delivery system. I do not think by 2025 we're going to have insurance companies that are taking premium and basically paying doctors without either managing them very closely or actually outright owning them. And so I think uh, the traditional notion of what we uh, think of as an insurance company is going away. And I note that WellPoint's already bought a Medicare Advantage plan in California to find out the secret sauce. This is a very high-quality, low-cost provider. Optum, a part of United Healthcare, employs over 5,000 doctors in 75 markets. Um, and you're seeing this, and all the big insurance companies are responding in the way I suggested. There may be variations on the tune, but I think the tune is pretty inevitable, as I predict. So by 2025, whatever Aetna is or Cigna is or Humana is, it's going to be very different from what it is today. So, Zeke, the third trend you identify, which is very provocative, is that the emergence of digital medicine will lead to the closing of hospitals and will transform the way care is delivered. I'm interested to understand what are the driving forces that will bring this around and what advances, specific advances in digital technology can facilitate this revolutionary change? Yeah, one thing that happens if you've got this integrated delivery system, suddenly your entire framework of finances changes. You're no longer in the mode of, you know, we got to get more people in beds because we make money by having our beds filled. We're, you know, we're, we cease thinking like a hotel and we start thinking much more like, you know, putting people in, hospitals are expensive. Putting people in hospital beds is expensive. What if we develop all this digital technology to monitor people at their home, to email or have web interactions? That is going to explode. Lots of innovation is going to happen in that space. Lots of investments happening in that space so that doctors can monitor their patients continuously. Or we already see this in digital dermatology where a patient can take a picture of their rash, send it to their dermatologist, and you know, get 
the, the standard dermatological answer already, which is, you know, cortisone cream on it or don't worry about it. You know, those are basically all they say anyway. And you've got a group in, uh, in Seattle that does webcam urgent care calls, and 75% of those calls are handled over the web without needing to go to a doctor. That is going to proliferate, and the consequence is fewer visits to the emergency room, fewer hospital admissions and increased productivity. I understand that at Kaiser, they use this digital dermatology arrangement and they've increased their uh, dermatologist's ability to handle patients by 50%. Well, that's a huge improvement in um, productivity. And I think we're going to see this across the area. Well, one consequence is you don't need so many hospital beds. And with hospitals already running under 70% occupancy on average across the country, a thousand hospitals I predict are going to close. It's interesting. I, I made that prediction. I showed the chapter to a health investor who's an expert in, in this area. And he said, oh, no, Zeke, you've got it wrong. And I'm like, wow, am I too high? Am I being overly aggressive? He says, no, it's going to be 2,000 hospitals. I said, well, that's insane as far as I can tell. So I'm comfortable thinking that 1,000 is the right prediction. And no one's going to, I mean, the Affordable Care Act doesn't say we've got to close 1,000 hospitals. No law is going to say it. It's going to be market forces that demonstrate there are better and more cost-effective ways of caring for people, and we don't need the 5,000 hospitals we have in the country. You know, 4,000 is more than enough to provide high-quality care to Americans. So I think that's going to be, again, it's not like we're going to be shuttering the hospitals and everyone's going to be put on the street. These hospitals are going to transform into rehabilitation facilities, doctor's office, um, urgent care facilities, outpatient imaging. There's lots of other things they can do. They don't need to be hospitals, uh, where, which are the most expensive part of the uh, healthcare system. So, Zeke, the way we deliver care uh, and the way how care is delivered will definitely change the way doctors are educated. And that leads to your sixth and final megatrend. How do you see medical education transforming, and what are some of the drivers associated with that? Yeah, well, you know, one of the big problems is that healthcare education is uh, stuck. When Flexner wrote his report in 1910, the recommendation is you have a bunch of uh, collegiate science, then you go to two years of preclinical work, two years of clinical work in medical school focused at the hospital level. You professionalize the medical professors. They're no longer practitioners. And that is you know, just not what we need going forward. We need doctors to be trained to work in teams. We need doctors to understand to how to manage big data and tracking patients, how to actually lead teams, how to uh, negotiate with their patients to actually get them to do uh, what's important for their health. We need doctors to understand, you know, cost of putting in cost-effective and lean process improvements. Um, so we're going to have to transform how we train doctors to care for patients. I mean, another one important is, you know, if the hospitals are actually going to be declining as the center of care, we need our doctors trained in outpatient care much more. And I think that's vitally important that they move out of the four walls of the hospital much more into outpatient facilities, urgent care facilities, treating people at home and get that experience. But we're not set up that way. And medical schools are very, very slow to adopt any innovative uh, changes. So I think that's going to have to change. And, and lastly, the way we train, you know, interns and residents and subspecialty fellows like oncologists and cardiologists are going to have to change. A lot of that training is unnecessary. As I point out to people, when I trained to become a cancer doctor, it was a three-year training program, only one year of which was clinical experience with patients. Two years were supposed to be research, and yet most of the people we train do not go into research. Why are we wasting their time? They're among the most highly trained people, and you're blowing two years of their time. That seems crazy to me. So we're going to have to rethink very, very much how we train people. And, you know, again, this is a, this has not been, the healthcare system has not of its own accord done a great job of transforming its medical education experience. Flexner came from the outside and I, I dare say we're going to need another shock from the outside to really transform the uh, medical education system. So with the limited amount of time, I actually wanted to go back to another, it's your fourth trend. And that is you claim the end of employer sponsored insurance. What are the implications if this happens, and are there any drawbacks to this trend becoming reality? Well, um, first of all, why do I think we'll have an end of employer-sponsored insurance? I think uh, the fact is um, 
if the exchange, uh, and this is predicated on the exchanges becoming a desirable place to shop for insurance and an easy place to shop for insurance. Because once that happens, it's, you know, then what's the rationale for employer-sponsored insurance? Well, one rationale is we have this great tax break that we give people who get employer-sponsored insurance that offsets thousands of dollars of the cost of the health insurance. But other than that, there's not really a great rationale. And economists have railed against this system. It creates job lock, uh, so people are stuck in their job. It limits their choice because most employers don't give people a choice of insurance companies. It creates inflationary pressures. So there's lots of good rationales to move off it. On the other hand, employees are used to it. Uh, they've got a lot of experience with it, and, and you know we're not necessarily all super flexible in moving off it. So I think it's going to take time. And as I say in the book, it's not going away in the sense that even my prediction is that 20% of the private employers are still going to offer employer-sponsored insurance in a decade. But I do think, you know, the flip side is people like my children, you know, in their 20s and early 30s, they buy a lot of their stuff on the on the internet. They're used to buying almost everything on the internet, whether it's computers or clothes. And, you know, buying insurance is not that different for them on the internet. They can compare, and I think they're going to be used to it. And having that ability so that, you know, when you switch jobs, you don't switch insurance, having that continuity of insurance company, I think is going to be a big advantage to people. It also, as I said before, puts downward price pressure on the system, which is very, very desirable to keep people focused on, you know, how can we deliver the same or better care more efficiently. So I, I think that's, you know, the best argument against me, the best argument against me, Massachusetts. When they created their connector, it, employer-sponsored insurance didn't go down. It actually went up because more workers went to their employer and said, hey, you know, I need to have insurance. You need to provide me insurance. Or if their employer offered insurance, they actually took it up at greater numbers. Well, maybe, but I think we're going to find the alternative. Dr. Zeke Emanuel, author of Reinventing American Healthcare, thanks for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Great pleasure. This has been a special edition of the Business of Government Hour, a conversation with authors, exploring ideas for improving government effectiveness, with Dr. Zeke Emanuel, author of Reinventing American Healthcare, and chairman of the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the Perlman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania. Be sure to join us next week for another informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government effectiveness. For the Business of Government Hour, I'm Michael Keegan, and thanks for joining us. This has been the Business of Government Hour. Be sure to visit us on the web at businessofgovernment.org. There you can learn more about our programs and get a transcript of today's conversation. Until next week, it's businessofgovernment.org.